It's 1948 in Patterson, New Jersey, and in a small room, a man is typing, typing away at his aunt's house. This is where he can think, remembering vivid images of what happened last year, recording them first in a written journal that he got at the stationery store, and then typing them. The hitchhiking, the things that farmers and truck drivers said, the migrant workers, the jazz music, the bebop. I worked out an intricate mathematical thing which determines how assiduously I'm getting my novel typed and revised day after day. It's too complicated to explain, but suffice it to say that yesterday I was batting 246, and after today, my batting average rose to 306. The point is, I've got to hit like a champion. I've got to catch up and stay with Ted Williams, currently hitting 392. Typing away the Chinese food and the painful emotions. In my fantasy of glee, there is no sea light and no beatness, just the wind blowing through the kitchen window on an October morning. He jogs to get himself into shape to get into this typing mood. When he's done typing, he fixes up his copy and types some more. Eventually, he decides that he'll create a roll of typing paper so that he never has to stop and type for hours. It'll become a great American work. Right now, it's just typing. We know the political image of 1948. Truman holding up a paper that says Dewey beats Truman when exactly the opposite had happened. He had won the presidency for another term. He's holding it up with glee. It's black and white, that image, and it makes us think that it's old. And it is old, of course. It's 72 years old now, that election, that result, that image. But it's not so far away, and it's not an unmodern time. That's why I bring up. Jack Kerouac, the writer who's typing at this time about a hitchhiking trip that he took through the United States the year before. We think of him, Kerouac, perhaps if we think of him at all as a guy from the 50s or the the 60s, right? Wasn't he a hippie writer? Well, the hippies read him and were inspired by him. But his travels are in the 40s. He doesn't get this crazy, terrible scroll published till 57 as publishing company after publishing company, editor after editor, turns him down. But he's right there in the thick of it in 1948, along with other things we know today. The bikini, 1948. Slowly the fashions were becoming more daring, gaining popularity. Prefab housing for all of those post-war veterans coming in. The first Polaroid camera. NASCAR's first race of modified stock cars, Daytona Beach. The game of Scrabble. Televisions in a million households in 1948. 5,000 just three years earlier. The American Broadcasting Company, otherwise known as ABC, begins television services on WFIL-TV in Philadelphia. The first monkey astronaut, Albert I, is launched into space from White Sands, New Mexico. The LP record is introduced by Columbia Records. It's a long-playing 33 and a third RPM phonograph format. The average wage in 1948 per year, $2,950. But that's okay. The average cost of a new house, $7,700. New car, $1,250. Gallon of gas, 16 cents. Margaret Chase Smith is elected United States Senator and becomes the first woman to serve both in the House of Representatives and in the United States Senate. Lawrence Olivier's film Hamlet opens in the U.S. You could see it for 60 cents. A loaf of bread, 14 cents. Hamburgers, 45 cents. Both North Korea, the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea, is founded in its capital, Pyongyang, by its leader, Kim Il-sung, and South Korea, too, is founded. The Cleveland Indians win the World Series. At the same time, its home city's population reaches the peak of nearly a million people. There's a few songs we might recognize that are the pop songs of the era. Frank Sinatra singing All of Me. Art Mooney singing I'm Looking Over a Four-Leaf Clover. Or Kay Kaiser's The Woody Woodpecker Song, the theme to that cartoon. There were famous deaths in 1948. Gandhi dies in an assassination. But in other ways, it seems like a closing out year for the 19-teens and the turn of the century. Bill Cody dies. D.W. Griffith dies. Charles Evans Hughes, 1916 Presidential candidate and Supreme Court justice dies. Edith Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's wife. So does Orville Wright, one of the inventors of the airplane. But not to be dreary, there are also births. Andrew Lloyd Webber, 
Glenn Fry, John Ritter, you know, Three's Company, Samuel Jackson, Ozzy Osbourne, Donna Summer, Al Gore, and Prince Charles are all born in this year. So is Louis Black and Terry Bradshaw. You walk in New York at this time in 1948, you see Times Square full of bebop jazz clubs. <laughs> In San Francisco, Jack Kerouac writes, We all got together and drove in several cars to Chinatown for a big fabulous dinner off the Chinese menu with chopsticks, yelling conversation in the middle of the night in one of those free-swinging great Chinese restaurants of San Francisco, stretched out ahead of us, the fabulous white city of San Francisco on her eleven mystic hills with the blue Pacific and its advancing wall of potato patch fog beyond and smoke and goldenness. You go to L.A. and you have Billy Berg's Hollywood Jazz Club. The first In-N-Out Burger opens in Baldwin Park. The population of Los Angeles bursting over a million and a half, so much that the area code 213 is assigned to them. New York gets 212. Why are these numbers? Well, big cities get an advantage. The phone company gives New York and L.A. the Numbers that are closest to the top of the dial, so you don't have to pull your finger too far when you're turning the phone dial. The 1920s Palace, the Shrine Auditorium, is gleaming. Movie stars join for the Academy Awards, as James Baskett received an Academy Honorary Award for his portrayal of Uncle Remus in Song of the South, the first African American to win an Academy Award. And amid all of this, a presidential election is held, a battle for America's soul, as the president is going to call it. October 25, 1948, it's exactly one week before Election Day, and all of America is caught up in election fever. Obviously, something I'm, we'll probably be talking about today is the, the amazing degree of similarities between what was going on in 1948 and what's happening now. But anyway, on that night at Chicago Stadium, October 25th, 48, Truman said, it is not just a battle between two parties. It is a fight for the very soul of the American government. That's A.J. Bame. Now, we talked to A.J. Bame two years ago on My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, and it's great to have him back. He is the author now of Dewey Defeats Truman, the 1948 Election, and the Battle for America's Soul. You uh, wrote another book about Truman. Yeah. You know, there's a few reasons why that occurred. Um, the first is, is this. You know, Truman is a person who found himself somehow at the center of some of the most epic, greatest stories in our country's history. And there's so many of them, but there are really two, to my mind, that that are the best. And one is um, the story told of his first four months in office in the accidental president. And even before that was done, I had already started working on this new book, new book which is called Dewey, Dewey Defeats Truman, about his uh, victory in the 1948 election. Does it get easier? Was this book easier to write than the first one? There's no such thing as an easy book to write. I'll <laughs> tell you, you know, every time I write a book, and I guess I'm in four or five in now, I always say to myself, I'm never going to do this again, because the the amount of stress it, it takes to actually complete something. In my last book, in, in the acknowledgments, I, I, I described it as trying to usher 125,000 kittens across a busy highway, you know, because 125,000 words, what are you going to mess up? What are you going to get wrong? What are the critics going to attack you for? What doesn't quite make sense? It never ends. But uh, here we are again. It's going to be released on June 2nd, 2020. His last name, BAME, B-A-I-M-E, if you're looking on Amazon. There's a lot going on. And the president is a relative newcomer to national politics. who The American people don't know that well. So he's a new president, and he's a president who was never supposed to be president in the first place. Because um, he was a vice president under FDR, and he, he he became the vice president by mistake. So that's why I call my last book the Accidental President. Because when FDR becomes when he dies on April twelfth, nineteen forty five, Truman becomes president by accident. Those are his words by accident. And so the first part of this new book is basically it's it, the degree of pleasure 
by which Republicans watched this this president going down the tubes politically. He lost the 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 uh, the faith of the American people completely. So he ends the war with an 87 percent approval rating, and then he nosedives down to 37 percent in this sort of comedy of errors. FDR was from the best schools. He was you know upper class. He, he had always had the best preparation in all kinds of ways, and he, uh, he had been president for a long time, longer than anyone else. Now, when Truman becomes president, he had no college degree. He had never had the money to earn, own his own home. He had never been the governor of a state, never been the mayor of a city, and here he is, suddenly become president. So people, you know, after the war ended, and it was time for Truman to assume the presidency in his own right, he put out this thing called the 21 point program. And he basically told Americans, hey, I'm a liberal of the FDR short. And America was sick of it. Um, they'd, they'd had enough of the New Deal and they wanted something new. And Truman was not that for them. The atomic bomb ended the war faster than people thought w- would happen. And when the war ended and Truman had to begin his presidency in his own right, everything was going to go wrong because the, the, the country had to switch from wartime economy back to peacetime. There were shortages of everything. There were labor strikes. There was no meat on the on shelves in supermarkets. Uh, vast numbers of uh, veterans who fought in the war came home and there was a housing shortage. So there was literally 100,000 people uh, 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 living on the streets in Chicago. So all of these things were going wrong and there was really no way to write them. Yeah, and they loses the uh, house uh, 1946, which was a big blow because FDR had won that house when he won election in 1932 with a big margin. And now the Republicans get the house for the first time since the New Deal. That had to hurt a lot. And uh, But he, despite that, you know, he has some accomplishments in that period of time that he's not yet reelected. Maybe you could talk a bit about about that. I think the most important accomplishment at that time was the uh, was crystallizing a political philosophy of his own. I would say when we get to, when we get to 1947, of course, there's the Truman Doctrine, and we see the beginnings of the Marshall Plan, and um, the economy start to tick upward. Inflation is off the charts, but you start to see inflation flatten a little bit. Um, and uh, but really, the most important things he, his accomplishments were in foreign relations. Which, you know, for everyday voters, Americans understood that foreign relations were really important, but it was housing shortage. It was it was uh, inflation, the cost of living. These were the most important issues for um, for everyday American voters. Yeah. And some of these things, I guess I'm thinking of like Truman Doctrine are are also a little bit, um, uh, you know, we're looking at them retroactively. Probably people didn't know what the uh, you know, he's totally changing American foreign policy in the sense of our stance towards the Soviet Union, but I don't know how much the average Joe American actually knew that was happening. And another way to look at it is this. The Truman Doctrine, take the, take the Truman Doctrine, just basically what, what it was, so people understood, stand what it was. Imagine Truman, he's lost the faith of the American people, and he, he, he finds out through his State Department that the British, who have been funding Greece and Turkey, uh, the Brits are broke and they're going to stop giving money to Greece and Turkey. And they're sure that that would mean that those governments were going to fall and the Soviets were going to move in. And then suddenly you have the Soviets controlling this uh, this strategically important territory during the early years of the Cold War. This was going to be very bad. So Truman has to get to get get. Um, you know, an opposition Republican Congress on board with this idea that he was going to spend 400 or something like that million dollars in handouts to foreign governments asking for nothing in return during a time when the American economy was a source of great agitation and anxiety for people. George Marshall comes back from World War II and becomes increasingly disturbed, really right after victory, after the autumn of 1945, as he sees the disintegration of American military power in Europe, rather than a more careful demobilization and organized withdrawal, for which he had planned since 1943. When President Truman presented Marshall with the Distinguished Service Medal in 1945, 
He said that although millions gave America extraordinary service, Marshall gave it victory. 1945 also saw Marshall dispatched to China as the president's special representative to negotiate a truce between Chiang Kai-shek and the communists. General Eisenhower, then chief of staff, visited his former boss during the negotiations. He says publicly several times in 1945, speaks to the New York Herald Tribute Forum and the Salvation Army National Convention. We cannot leave Europe. And indeed, in November 1945, Marshall wanted to retire. He had served 44 years in active duty. President Truman decides otherwise. He puts him immediately to China to try to settle the Chinese war between nationalists and communists. And also, although he doesn't know it till the next year, to set him up to be Secretary of State replacing Jimmy Burns. The outcome in China was not great. The communists and nationalists were not going to settle just based on America's say. But it wasn't Marshall's fault. Truman knows this. Marxists who seemed to count on and encourage China's economic collapse as a way of furthering their objectives had no interest in peace. Marshall's going to see a lot of this. There were some Americans who wanted to do the same to Germany, to watch it collapse. Henry Morgenthau, the American Treasury Secretary, suggested this, the Morgenthau plan. It was soundly rejected by other members of FDR, FDR's cabinet and didn't reflect Truman's wishes. But that's how Marshall views the Soviets, the same as the Marxists in China, wanting to see Germany collapse so that they can move in. But in China, Marshall has another problem, and that's the nationalists. They presumed that U.S. national interests required it to support them, and they rejected doing anything to help the United States or to reach out to the people to try to thwart the communist offensive, to make any domestic reforms. Marshall and Truman pushed them to do it. Marshall feels they're not interested either. And so in January 1947, Marshall leaves. Marshall received the oath of office as Secretary of State from Chief Justice Vinson early in 1947. The president enthusiastically endorsed the former chief of staff at a critical time in history. It was fairly said that Mr. Truman selected him not because of his experience, but because he was Marshall. There's nothing that I can say at this time regarding matters that pertain to my position in the State Department. But I assume the duties with a great, with a feeling of great responsibility and a very earnest desire to carry out the foreign policy of this government in the manner that uh, has been so uh, splendidly exemplified by my predecessor, uh, Mr. Burns, my old friend. The new secretary brought imagination and a dignified intensity to his job, which was equal to the world challenge. And he arrives in Washington to receive the nomination of Secretary of State. It's passed unanimously in the Senate. This is a war hero. Arthur Vanderberg, a Republican from Michigan, makes sure that it's unanimous in the Senate. He's the majority leader and chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And he's going to be awfully important in the history that happens during this time, the formation of the United Nations, and what happens next with Marshall. So it's not a great time. In March 1947, Marshall headed a delegation to Moscow, whose mission was the peace agreement on Germany and Austria. The opportunity to observe the Russian bear in his native environment was valuable in view of increasing Soviet hostility. Russia already loomed as the largest question mark in America's future. Britain is pushed to the edge economically, and they're the power that needs to maintain a presence in Europe. There's a problem in Greece. Communists in Greece are advancing, and the U.S. wants to try to help. The British are the ones that are in Greece at this time, but they send a memo that they do not have the resources to help and have to relinquish. And this puts Washington under the gun to act quickly. In fact, Marshall gets this news from Britain just on February, right when he becomes Secretary of State. He recommends 
that Greece unify all of its parties into a government against the communists and also the extreme right parties, make domestic reforms, and that the U.S. provide economic and military aid. He brings this to congressional leaders and the president. Marshall asserts to them, a communist victory in Greece would be a disaster. It's not alarmist to say that we are faced with the first crisis of a series which might extend Soviet domination to Europe, the Middle East, Asia. Europe is still emerging from the devastation and dislocation of the most destructive war in history. Within its own resources, Europe cannot achieve within a reasonable time economic stability. The solution would be much easier, of course, if all the nations of Europe were cooperating, but they are not. Far from cooperating, the Soviet Union and the Communist parties have proclaimed their determined opposition to a plan for European economic recovery. We just have to contain the opportunism of the Soviets in the face of Britain's withdrawal. Dean Acheson makes this case stronger. Greece will fall if there's not money immediately from Congress. And Congress appropriates $250 million for Greece and $150 million for Turkey, which also is facing Soviet pressure. Marshall's still trying to form a policy that will somewhat reach out to the Soviet Union. In fact, when Truman makes some anti-communist statements, Marshall sends him a note. Maybe we should cool down the rhetoric. There's still Austria. There's still parts of Germany to worry about here, and we need Soviet cooperation. But on March 12th, 1947, Truman makes his Truman Doctrine speech. America will change slightly, perhaps slightly, perhaps greatly, and oppose the Soviet Union in its opportunistic aims. You have a couple things going on. One, it appears, and there's information from the British, French, and friendly German governments that Europe is in trouble and is going to need an aid package much larger than what was given to Greece for this winter, that the Soviets are not interested in helping, not interested in providing money and food to the sectors that they're in charge of, and that they'd like to see the other sectors collapse, perhaps they could move in. There's opposition. On the Republican Party, Truman faces Republican isolationists who are none too happy with spending all of this money and sending it abroad. People like Robert Taft, of Ohio. And on the Democratic side, there's Democratic congressmen a warning. They're not going to stand for the presentation of another large package. These are a lot of the Southern congressmen. But by May 1947, Marshall decides that he's got to do something and he'll stake everything on it. But he's got to get a way of getting word to the European governments that America will stand by you so that they don't treat directly with the Soviets. Or, and he's got to get a way of doing it without drawing big opposition from the Congress. So he decides on a unique low-key approach. He will announce the new initiative, not at some meeting in Washington, but as a war hero and secretary of state, he's getting all sorts of invitations to college graduations. And usually these speeches are not something that people pay attention to. And he decides, will it be University of Wisconsin? Will it be Yale? No, he decides on his speech at Harvard, June 5th. Truman and Marshall's policy are often thought of in history as one thing, but they're not exactly Marshall had enough independent political power and relationships with Congress and with the American public as a war hero that he could sort of pursue his policy, where Truman's doctorate represented a much more political and strong anti-communist, not to say Marshall wasn't. One of the primary objectives of the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. 
This was a fundamental issue in the war with Germany and Japan. Our victory was won over countries which sought to impose their will and their way of life upon other nations. Nonetheless, Truman supports the putative plan of... To be quite clear, this unprecedented endeavor of the new world to help the old is neither sure nor easy. It is a calculated risk. It is a difficult program. And you know far better than I do the political difficulties involved in this program. But there's no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. Here's what Truman says in his memoir. We had sent food to Europe, but millions there still did not have enough to eat. We had made loans to the other countries of Europe, but the war had so disrupted the patterns of trade and industry that the amounts we loaned were far effective than we had hoped. I was disturbed because the loan to Britain had failed to accomplish what we thought it would. Would. Detailed reports came to my office daily from our government agencies about conditions abroad. A steady stream of appeals poured in from representative leaders of many foreign nations, virtually all of whom expressed the gravest concern over the economic situation and over the gains which communism might score if there was no improvement. Marshall's report confirmed my conviction that there was no time to lose in finding a method for the revival of Europe. General Marshall is one of the most astute and profound men I have ever known. Here's a story that uh, Truman tells about Marshall. As Secretary of State, Marshall had to listen to more staff talk than when he was Chief of Staff. He would listen for a long time without comment. But when the debates between members of the staff seemed destined to go interminably, and he could stand it no longer, he would say, gentlemen, don't fight the problem, decide it. Dean Acheson told me a characteristic characteristic story about Marshall when he first took over. Marshall had asked Dean Acheson to stay on as undersecretary and said, I want the most complete and blunt truths from you, particularly about myself. Dean Acheson replied, do you, General? Yes, Marshall said, I have no feelings except a few, which I reserve for Mrs. Marshall. Here's what Dean Acheson says in a speech in Cleveland, Mississippi, May 8, 1947. This war, he said, will not be over until the people of the world can again feed and clothe themselves and face the future with some degree of confidence. So this sets off various moods. At first, there is some continued desire, real or head fake, to bring the Soviet Union into this plan. They could be part of the Marshall Plan. That would have been a very different history than we know, right? Soviet press, as usually determined by Pravda, and meetings that the British have with the Soviets and has them seeming very standoffish. Stalin asks for more details of the program continuously throughout June and July. They warn that it's a mistake. And they make smaller deals with Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia for their own support programs. Tens of millions of dollars. Marshall feels that the Soviets want Germany to go into economic collapse. France is also concerned about proceeding without Russia involved. They're worried about taking a stand that doesn't involve Russia in all of this. They're also worried about Germany. They just fought a war against not Russia, but Germany. We're worried about Germany building, for instance, its coal region in the Ruhr. Even the American Congress asks for more information about this. One Republican, Charlie Halleck, says that Congress needs to be a partner, not surprised like we were with the Turkey and Greece aid packages. But it starts getting Republican support, particularly as the situation is seen and as Marshall advocates in speeches, Dean Acheson advocates in speeches, Truman does. The American Legion backs it in August. Herbert Hoover makes positive statements about an aid package to Europe. The U.S. takes what actions it can without a congressional appropriation. For instance, releasing wartime assets seized from Italy and giving it back to that government, as long as they remain anti-communist, and 
returning to them the Italian Navy warships that they seized after the war. They restore industrial production in Germany without Russia in a deal between Britain, France, and Germany that there will be a joint European running of that industrial region. Republicans, Robert Taft, Speaker Martin, Arthur Vanderberg, back the Marshall Plan in September. But there's still a dance that goes on about the price. How much will it be? Remember, the aid package to Greece was $250 million. Marshall's looking for something much larger. He says that Europe will face an intolerable winter in 47 and 48 if a big package isn't seen. Congressional committees visit Europe. It goes all the way to December with negotiations with the Congress and also diplomatic negotiations in Europe and statements by the Soviet Union and they're consolidating their power with the Warsaw Pact nations. But eventually Congress overwhelmingly passes the Economic Cooperation Act of 1948, we know as the Marshall Plan. April 48, President Truman signs it. And over the next four years, Congress is going to appropriate $13.3 billion for European recovery. Now what does this mean? We hear about the Marshall Plan a lot, but... What does it mean? It comes in a lot of forms. That's an awful lot of money. Let me put that in perspective because, again, time and money, history and money, right? It's hard to understand things. That's why I like to use a couple numbers instead of just one. Because the easy number to say is it's something like uh, $200 billion today, right? But that's comparing like the price of eggs and cheese and saying, you know, if you multiply that, then... Uh, by the prices today, this is what it would be, like using the consumer price index. But that's not really the way to look at it for something so large as the Marshall Plan. It might work in other ways. It might work with somebody's salary or the, what the cost of a car is, right? But if you look at um, how many $13.3 billion were out there, you know, what's the economic relative power of that? It's something like 1.3 trillion. So you almost have to say it's it's and and I think even more, but that's what economists have computed. Um I think it's even more, but you have to think of it in terms of say the stimulus that was just passed at 2.2 trillion. Something it's also a political and psychological dimension that things this large just simply weren't passed. Okay. Some examples of what Marshall Plan pays for, freight subsidies, freight subsidies for 16.8 million private voluntary relief packages from Americans to Europe. So you want to send something to Europe, you're going to send it to through uh, this Marshall Plan fund. Funds building a new wharf in North Borneo to help that British colony export vitally needed rubber. Assists in building railroads and water systems in French North Africa. Fifty million for medicine to combat tuberculosis. Technical assistance. Over 3,000 Europeans make six-month visits to various U.S. industries to learn new techniques. There is a similar program in agriculture. The Ford Motor Company in Britain receives funds to replace machine tools needed to produce cars, trucks, and tractors for export, earning valuable foreign exchange credits. The Otis Elevator Company helps modernize British factories, and the value of its investment is guaranteed by insurance from the Marshall Plan. The money enables Portugal to purchase key equipment and materials to build a new hospital tender ship for its cod fishing fleet. The French aircraft industry is able to purchase propellers for the aircraft it is producing. An alcohol production plant in Scotland is granted $6.5 million reducing Britain's need to import alcohol and facilitating plastics, pharmaceutical, and rayon production. Just a host of things 
that the Marshall Plan provides to Europe, literally fulfilling its need and letting Europe know in a very clear way that there is an option for them outside of working with Joseph Stalin. This also attracts opposition. You know, there's some initial opposition from Robert Taft and the conservatives in the Republican Party. It also attracts opposition from Henry Wallace. Unconditional aid to anti-Soviet nations, Wallace says, will unite the world against America and divide America against itself. The way forward was to fund the UN, not to employ foreign policy measures that the Soviet Union would view as confrontational. In the name of crisis, America is asked to ignore the World Tribunal of the United Nations and take upon herself the role of prosecutor, judge, jury, and sheriff. What a role. Hysteria is whipped up in the name of crisis. The Congress is asked to rush through a momentum decision as if great armies are already on the march. I hear no armies marching, Wallace said. I hear no armies marching. I hear the world crying out for peace. That's Wallace, and he makes a speech in Madison Square Garden and then embarks on a tour. This is the situation you've got set up in the election of 1948. When I write these books, I try to um, create these scenes as they happen so that when you're reading the book, you feel like you're present in the room. And one of my favorite scenes that I wrote about was Truman with uh, the head of the um, NAACP, a man named Walter Francis White, who is a fascinating character, and Eleanor Roosevelt. The three of them, they go up and they give speeches at the base of the Lincoln Memorial, and Truman becomes the first president to address the NAACP. It had never happened. And really what you're seeing here, Truman is figuring out that um, the African-American vote in 1948 is going to have greater sway than it ever had before. But more importantly, he confronts this moral decision that the way the country has been treating its black citizens was wrong. There was a rash of lynchings after the war. And this, I go deep into this in the book. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, when I was doing this research, I couldn't believe that these things were happening in our own country. African-American soldiers who had served the country in war came home and in some cases, even still wearing their military uniforms, were lynched, killed by white Americans. And Truman realizes that this is wrong. And so that uh, he makes the decision to support African-American rights. And that is the beginning of the American Civil Rights Movement. Thank you. Thank you very much. I can't. I have to have them up where I can see. I'm sorry that the microphones are in your way, but they have to be where they are because I've got to be able to see what I'm doing, as I always am able to see what I'm doing. It's hard to imagine the scene in Philadelphia in 1948. Uh, as the convention begins. And one of the reasons that this city's chosen for both the Democrats and the Republicans is that they've got a, a nice hall. It's not air conditioned, but it's a large hall. And it can fit the television equipment because this is going to be the first series of conventions televised. And television equipment comes from New York down. And so the speeches of Dewey and Truman are filmed. They've been on radio before. A lot of people are going to be listening on radio, but this is the first televised speech. But Republicans have their speech, have their convention in the city, and it's well-organized, precision, but it's also, by some, seen as a little dull. Even though there is a nomination fight by the third ballot, Dewey wins and Taft folds. Earl Warren, who's a very popular governor of of, of California, is chosen. Dewey's going to begin a very expensive and, you know, train ride through the country campaigning. Thomas E. Dewey's public career was launched in 1931 when crime was a national scandal. Four years later, early in Mayor LaGuardia's term, Dewey was appointed special prosecutor by the governor to war on organized crime in New York. Mr. Dewey? You have been given a most difficult task. 
but the opportunity of helping the people of this city. What can we do to help you? There's a detective in New York, Mr. Mayor, who I think is one of the best detectives in the United States. I'd like to have him head my squad of detectives. From the beginning, Dewey faced an almost hopeless job, clearing out gangsters and racketeers whose hold upon the city had been tightening through years of Tammany rule. Now look here, Benton, you've been loading for Mason again. Now for the last time, are you gonna keep out of our territory or not? I'm not. But I don't need any protection. Dewey's small hand-picked staff began its attack on the underworld by ferreting out secret records and getting the frightened victims of the rackets to talk. After long months of hard, patient, dangerous work, Dewey had collected enough evidence to move in on the city's leading racketeers. Out of the 73 indictments he secured against key criminals, Dewey convicted all but one. Rackets, which had flourished with complete immunity, began breaking up as the city's gang overlords went off to jail. On the strength of this brilliant record, Tom Dewey was nominated for district attorney. Defeating the Tammany candidate by an unprecedented majority, he continued his crime-smashing record and was on the road to the governor's mansion at Albany. But in Philadelphia later, the Democrats now have their convention. And it's just seen as something that's, you know, the newspapers are talking about how various saloons are having uh, low prices uh, for the delegates as they normally would. There's just this kind of uh, one of the bars puts a uh, an actual donkey out outside the bar to attract uh, uh, delegates. Uh, and that there's just a very sour mood throughout the proceedings. And then there's a fight over civil rights. And then at the end of this, very late, because of all the trouble, Truman takes the stage. At 2 a.m., I was escorted to the convention floor, above and onto the speaker's platform. The huge hall was packed with weary, perspiring delegates who had spent three days and nights in Bedlam. They were still capable of making noise, however, and they greeted me with thundering applause. But it was clear to me that the work of the opposition in propagandizing my chances of winning plus the splintering within our own party had taken its toll. The party was dispirited and dejected. I meant to give him something to cheer about and something to campaign for. Senator Barkley and I will win this election and make these Republicans like it. Don't you forget that. It was not the first time in history that a president had personally appeared at a convention hall to accept the nomination. The first was Franklin Roosevelt in 1932. The effect was the same in both cases, I think. Ever since its inception, that party has been under the control of special privilege, and they concretely proved it in the 80th Congress. I had been working on my notes for the speech on the train and went over them, in the room downstairs just before the escorting committee arrived to usher me to the convention floor. I had my notes in a black notebook, which I placed on the lectern as I waited for the hall to grow quiet enough for me to speak. The Democrats had been waiting for hear somebody say positively that we were going to win, and the effect on them was electric. So Truman goes out on the road, and he's campaigning against his own Congress. Time and again, I have recommended improvements in Social Security law, including extending protection to those not now covered, increase the amount of the benefits, reduce the eligibility age of women from 65 to 60 years. Congress studied the matter for two years but couldn't find time to extend the increased benefits, but it did find time to take Social Security and benefits away from 750,000 people. And they passed that over my veto. 
Okay, so Dewey's the Republican candidate. And there was this big tug of war within the Republican Party. Like, this is the first post-war presidential election. These people were ask, asking themselves, what is our political party? This is a whole new ballgame. What do we stand for? And Congress co was controlled by a um, powerful conservative coalition led by Robert Taft, Mr. Republican. Dewey was a Theodore Roosevelt progressive Republican. So he was on the left side of the party. So you've got this tug of war and Dewey ends up winning the nomination. But the interesting thing is when you put Dewey's plank up against Truman's, what, like, what did they support? What did they not support? They weren't that different. They were actually quite similar. And what Truman did was not, he ran not, he ran his election not against Dewey, but against the 80th Congress, because there was a vast divide between the conservative conservatism of the 80th Congress and Truman's policies. He's got the Truman Doctrine, which is maybe even a little more to say the right of where maybe FDR was going with Yalta and 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 his relationship with Stalton. And on the other hand, maybe he's going a little left, if we could, with uh, civil rights. And he's going to stir up a hornet's nest of trouble. He's going to end up having a third and a fourth party running against him in the election because he's he's angered so many people. That's right. So there are four candidates in the in the uh, in the nineteen forty eight election. There's Truman from the Democratic Party, Thomas Dewey with the Republicans, and maybe we can talk a little bit about what was going on there because the Republican Party experiencing a um, uh, an identity crisis at the time. There was a great tug of war between the left and the right within the Republican Party. But then you also have breakaway Democrat Henry Wallace, who was a a, a huge hero among intellectuals and far left voters, maybe the Bernie Sanders of his day. And he was, he was very, uh, Wallace was very controversial. And it was no secret that the, uh, the inner workings of his presidential campaign was being run by a clique of communists. Uh, then you have Strom Thurmond, who breaks away from the Democratic Party and launches the Dixiecrats. And this was a party of Southern Democrats who are going to fight Truman on the civil rights issue and fight for segregation and fight for uh, white supremacy. And it, amazingly th to think of today, you, do, you, you think like, how could this possibly happen? But a campaign that was based on white supremacy, Strom Thurmond won four states in 1948. Oh yeah, and as certainly, and those were states that otherwise, it was pretty costly for, for a Democrat running because in those days in the 1940s, you know, you usually could count on the solid South to be Democratic and not Republican. That's right. Absolutely. So in those days, the solid South was extremely important to the Democratic Party. Uh, these are generally speaking white conservative politicians who were aligned with the Democratic Party fiercely. And all of that relationship came out of the Civil War, right? Because you had Lincoln and the party of Lincoln, the Republican Party, the Union Army winning this, the Civil War. And white Americans in the South had never forgotten that. And all through these years, you had what you called the solid South because these, these um, powerful Democrats were aligned with the Democratic Party in opposition to the Republicans, just you know, out, of, out of loyalty after the Civil War. And these were some extremely powerful politicians who had been in office a long time and had risen to the, to the leadership of many of the important uh, committees in Congress. So it was very dangerous for a presidential candidate to piss these people off, which is exactly what Truman did. And so there's this amazing scene at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, the party adopts a civil rights plank, and there's this uproar, and all of these Southern politicians, very, very famous figures, they all stand up and they march right out of the hall. And that's the beginning of the Dick's Press. Yeah, so Truman's facing a real challenge with uh, three people who would rather be president than him, because at the same time, he's got the Dixiecrats walking out of the convention. You've got Wallace also, who um, was, I suppose, what was he? Uh, uh, he was a, you know, in the cabinet and then left the cabinet after having been uh, vice president under FDR. I think he was in Truman's cabinet for a time, and then uh, he's now running against him. And he's in Madison Square Garden with all kinds of like well-known liberal people. Uh, Elliot, Elliot Roosevelt, FDR's son, you know, supporting him, and 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 
So he's got challenges on his, his on the on the right, and then he's got this huge challenge, uh, which which um, I think your book does a good job of presenting that it really looks like it's uh, going to be a very big vote getter uh, in Henry Wallace's campaign. Absolutely, Wallace was one of my favorite people to write about when I was writing this book, and he's he's just so fascinating. But the most interesting thing about his candidacy to me was the degree to which it shed light on the cultural divide in our country that seems so prevalent today, like no other time during my lifetime. And let me give an example. Wallace would hold these crazy um, rallies and he could pack stadiums in New York and Los Angeles, pack them, and, uh, you know, full of basically, these are the kind of the beginning of the peacenik mo- uh, movement. You had, it was, it was, uh, Wallace was the, candidate of peace. He was insisting that Truman was going to lead America into a war with the Soviet Union, and he was saying we had to cooperate with the Soviet Union. And this was very controversial, and he was uh, very hard on civil rights. He was very much for civil rights. And so he could pack these urban stadiums, but it's fascinating when he goes down and campaigns through the rural South. His, his politics are so controversial that there are literally riots and stabbings at his rallies. And he's pelted with eggs and tomatoes and ice cream cones. What he did, he knew. He announced that he was going to do this campaign swing through the rural South where he knew they hated him. And he said, I'm not going to speak in any hall that does not allow white and black people to sit next to each other. I'm not going to stay in a hotel that does not allow black and white people to stay in it. And then so by the time he gets to the South, the whole South is infuriated and they want to kill this guy. And um, it took amazing amounts of courage to do what he did, um, even though he knew by the time he got down there, he had no chance of actually winning the presidency. He's a fascinating figure. And there's two things there are really linked to some of the politics of today. One is he was constantly called a communist, which I'd, I, I would suspect, although he had communists supporting him, American communists and perhaps some international communist. Um, I suspect he wouldn't like the label directly applied to him. And then also the Russians. you got to talk about the Russians with today's politics. You certainly had an agenda, whether Wallace wanted help, say, from Stalin or not, um, even if he was condemning any help that he might be getting if he was doing that. It was present, and there were, at the minimum, the Stalin was keeping tabs on what he was doing and finding ways to encourage the Wallace campaign. So you just have, you know, we think we're so different in these this era, but you, you do have some something in 1948, you know, things that are notes of today. Well, there's so many of them, and that's the reason why I wrote the book. I mean, it's like just the groundswell of white nationalism that we see today, impeachment headlines. We saw that in 1948. A president caught in a bitter public feud with his own Congress. We see that today. A resurgence of fake news accusations. We see that today. War and terrorism in the Middle East. The FBI on the trail of a major presidential candidate regarding a possible Russian conspiracy. All those things are happening in 1948, just like they're happening now. It's bizarre. But to me, when I was doing my research, there was One document I found in the Dewey Papers at the University of Rochester that that just blew my mind. And I was able to use that then at the Truman Library to illuminate more documentation on the degree to which people in 1948, political parties, political operatives were concerned that the Soviets were going to try to influence our election here. And I'll even read you right now a quote from a uh, from a Republican operative who said, uh, let's see. The Kremlin, this is from 1947, one year before the 48 election. The Kremlin will sponsor political disturbances everywhere it can throughout the next 12 months. It will try to influence the result of the 1948 election by every means conceivable. And what was going on is the Republicans were, were convinced that Stalin was going to try to influence the, the, the election to make sure that the Republicans lost and the Democrats won. The Democrats were concerned that the Soviets were going to influence or try to influence our election here for the, uh, to put a Republican in office. Um, and meanwhile, you've got Henry Wallace, who's marching around 
saying that we had to cooperate with the Russians and, you know, was aligned with the communists. So it, uh, Russia was very much on people's minds. And um, talk a bit about Dewey. Um, you know, we, we, we know him these days, I think, only as the guy that lost that election. But um, obviously in 1948, he was a real figure. Many people liked him for what he did in New York, cleaning up corruption there. And he had run against Roosevelt in 44. Or he didn't win, but people kind of said, well, you know, that, that would have been a tough beat anyway in the middle of a war. Um, he was a formidable candidate then, and I, I think that we don't, we don't realize that. He was an excellent candidate, frankly. And, um, you know, so sure was he that was he that he was going to win. I, ha I have this one scene in the book where he gives his last campaign speech at a rally in New York City at Madison Square Garden. And afterward, they all go to the train station. They're taking the train back up to Albany. And Dewey brings all the reporters in and, and off the record tells them who's going to be in his cabinet. And I have this described by more than one person present. They're describing him talking about this. And that's how sure he was he was going to win. And um, I think, you know, frankly, he would have been a very good president. You know, I think it was Alice Roosevelt or I believe that was it. who said he looked like the, the man on the wedding cake. And um, just this figure kind of floating above politics, not willing to kind of to throw a punch and 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 a lot of the stories that's why he lost i think you do a good job in the book of illustrating that he had run in 1944 and anyone who looks at like dewey bricker they're going to know that some people were turning their nose up at some of the how hard he ran during a war you know he was calling the the initially people thought he was talking about generals saying they were tired old men then he clarified and said it was the uh, administration, they, they're not the generals. And then um, he, uh, you, you reference an Oklahoma City speech where he had uh, attacked the president a little bit too far. And this time when he's running, he says, you know, I will not go down into the gutter with these people. I'm not going to make the mistake I made. So what we see is, uh, you know, uh, feature, not a bug. Uh, this is his strategy in 48 to try to win this time. It was very clear that his his idea going into this election was, as long as I don't screw it up, I've got it won. Because Truman was so unpopular at the time. And during the election, Truman becomes this American folk hero, this underdog who goes from town to town on this campaign train. And using oral histories, I have dozens of people who are on that train who could describe it. And so I can really put the reader, I know what cocktails they were drinking. I know how much a hamburger costs, you know what I mean? On that campaign train. Um, and, you know, I spent a lot of time with Dewey on election night. Uh, uh, there's a sizable portion of the book that I spent on election night, capturing the excitement of that night. And as it moved through and everybody's thinking Truman is going to lose and suddenly he doesn't. And for, for Dewey, to, for what it was like for him to experience that, because he was such a competitive man, so competitive. And this was going to be his second presidential election lost. And he must have known. I mean, he was an amazing governor of New York. Did he pick up on it a little bit towards the end? He did. And what happened is it's election night. Uh, listen, it's the first ever TV broadcast election night so that they could see the, see the TV broadcast on election night for the first time. They're listening to the returns on the radio. And at one point, um, he shuts himself in his suite at the Roosevelt Hotel with a yellow pad and a pen, and he just spends hours there by himself trying to come to grips with what was happening to him. And he knew that at that point, he was going to be remembered not for his accomplishments, but as the guy who lost to Truman. Yeah, and that has pretty much come up. Now, I'm glad you, you mentioned that about Dewey, that he'd probably be a good president. I, I feel the same way. I feel like we would have came out of 48, you know, not with a bad president. Perhaps, though, you know, uh, catering to so many people in a party and that uh, maybe he would have been uh, not as forceful because of the way that he won the presidency on that kind of like parade uh, of party, but uh, he does go on in 1964 to uh, do a stop Goldwater campaign to try to stop the party from nominating uh, Goldwater and Goldwater and pick somebody more moderate. 
Um, and yeah, he's not remembered, unfortunately, for much else. But here was a guy that had cleaned up corruption in uh, in New York City, or gone a long way to do it, and uh, you know, pro- had some good policies. Probably would have would done right by the office. Uh, it's kind of funny that um, states that Dewey's going to win, and Truman, the incumbent president, actually is going to lose. Uh, as a Democrat, you know, will surprise people today. So he's going to lose New York. Truman, Dewey will win that. It's home state. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, you know, the, almost the whole Northeast, except for Massachusetts, you know, is going to go for uh, against uh, Truman. So you have this kind of like Democrat running who's going for the interior of the country, some of the west of the country, the at least the border south and parts of the south that he can that he that that survives the Thurman challenge, and it's almost the exact opposite of um, of politics today. You have a guy that's a little gruff. He says whatever he means. He you know he 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 doesn't like people who make like the long winded speeches and and stuff like that. He he takes forceful opinions. He attacks the media. He makes fun of the media. Um, so you know, obviously, the, you see some some similarities to a possible situation today. Not to su- not to suggest that the outcome will be the same, but you have a incumbent president who, uh, you know, at most of his presidency, pretty low in the polls, has his supporters, but has a lot of people against him too. Um, you, you've heard more than a little talk sometimes about, oh, if, if whoever gets the nomination will coast into the presidency. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting setup for, for, uh, it's, it's a good year to release a book like this. Well, it's interesting that you say that because when I decided to write this book is, uh, I saw that coming. That, that was very much, that was, we did that on purpose, but, um, you know, really in the end, uh, on the morning after the 1940 election, 48 election, you have two candidates specifically because Truman was supposed to lose, and he didn't. And it's interesting, what Dewey ended up deciding had happened is that he was betrayed by the farm vote. Farmers traditionally voted Republican. And after the election, I, I read all his letters. He wrote letters to his aunts and uncles and cousins and friends, and he answered the question that it, it, it was the farm vote. Those normally Republican states like Iowa, places like that, um, that uh, betrayed him. And they voted for Truman. And there's a few reasons why we get the, I get into in the book. But uh, at the same time, Truman, right when he finds out that he wins, he says out loud, labor did it. So he believes that it's organized labor, unions, the endorsement of unions. That's what brought him past the finish line. The technique I used at the whistle stops was simple and straightforward. There were no special gimmicks or oratorical devices. I refused to be coached. I simply told the people in my own language that they had better wake up to the fact that it was their fight. If they did not get out and help me win this fight, I treated them not like crowds of people, but like businessmen, tenant farmers, housewives, married veterans, laboring men, teachers, individuals with interest for whom I, as president, had a genuine concern. One of the things I tried to keep out was foreign policy. I had a couple of fears about it. I did my own podcast on 1948. Another factor I bring up, and uh, Iowa actually plays in, same thing happened with Trump in 2016 in various states, is Truman does worse than some of the senators and or governors running in 1948 on the Democratic ticket. For the last time that pollsters in America will ever do this in a presidential election, they stopped doing them a month before the election. They have done polls as a kind of extra newspaper goodie the readers really like. They did it for the 1936 elections, 1940, and 1944. And the polls were right in those elections. They weren't right in the exact percentages, but they were right about the outcome. The last poll that Gallup does shows 50% Dewey, 45% Truman. We all hear about coattails, presidential coattails, picking the congressional and senatorial candidates up when you're a really good presidential candidate. 
but a few times, not that often, particularly with Senate candidates, easier to observe, the reverse might have happened. The down ticket is forced <laughs> to prop up the presidential candidate in some states. Truman gets 50% of the popular vote in this election. Democratic Senate candidates across the country get 56%. But it even becomes clearer when you look at some individual states. You know, Illinois, there's a popular Senate candidate running there, Paul Douglas, who gets 55% of the Senate vote. Truman gets just 49% in Illinois. Very narrow win. So was it really Truman's campaign train and his folksy campaign that earned him Illinois? And, you know, he did go there. One of the video that's up on YouTube, which is a great little video, is of his stop in Rockford, Illinois. But Paul Douglas got 5% more. What's going on there? Train campaign? Or many Chicagoans and people inclined to vote Democrat anyway decided, okay, I'll vote for Truman. In Minnesota, Hubert Humphrey, former mayor of Minneapolis, civil rights advocate, gets 60% of the vote there running as a Senate candidate. Truman gets three points less. In Ohio, there's no Senate election, but Truman narrowly carries that state by two-tenths of a percent. But the gubernatorial candidate, Lausch, in the Democratic side, gets 200,000 more votes than Truman does. Iowa, you see this too. Very popular senator, Guy Gallette, Democrat, is getting 58% of the vote. Truman, just 50. 8% of those people in Iowa decided to vote Democrat for Senate and not to vote Democrat for the presidential election. So was it the train going through Iowa? Or the party apparatus and a lot of other factors? It happens. It's rare, but it happens. In some cases, you have this down ticket push up that happens. Jimmy Carter, he's outpolled 3% in 1976 by Democratic candidates that year running for Senate. 1992, Clinton's outpolled by the Democratic Senate candidates. 2004, Bush is beating his Senate candidates that are Republican nationally, right? But in Ohio, a state he needs for that election or he doesn't get the White House again, George Voinovich is getting 8% more than George W. Bush does in 2000, the state that only mattered in that election. He's being pulled up by the down ticket. Truman might have been the beneficiary of a rare trend. And so that while very often you have presidential coattails, these are kind of reverse coattails. In, and, and I think there was some... Um, also some additional uh, support for uh, straight ticket voting in those days, the machines and or the way you, the ballots were set up, you know. Uh, another was, um, and the others I've heard in other places, not my own theories in particular, but one was that Truman peaked at the right time. Couldn't have been better. But really it comes down to this. What it comes down to is you had a man, everybody said it was impossible he was going to win, and he put together this amazing nuts and bolts and cogs machines what they built the democrats what they did was fascinating they built a little research division with a bunch of people working in the, around the clock in washington dc and they had a couple speech writers working on major speeches in the white house right then you've got truman who was going around the country going to places town after town after town where presidential candidates never ventured little tiny places where 400 people would be out and he'd be out there in his pajamas and everywhere he went, he had information about that town from this research division. And uh, they would fly the speeches in, in little airplanes to the town where he was showing up when he had to give a big speech. And meanwhile, he had these campaigners on the train, Clark Clifford, all his aides living on the train, working through these speeches. But most of what Truman did, he would go out on his back platform in his train and he would have rudimentary facts. And he just had to speak off the cuff, town after town, making it up. And so really what it comes down to, this was a man who became an American folk hero. He went out and he won the hearts and minds of voters, including voters who had no faith in him months earlier, including voters from other political parties. And that's how he won. 
At first, the critics referred to my tour as a one-man circus and called it less efficient and less dignified than the campaign being put on by the Republicans. But as the crowds grew longer and longer, and as more people flocked to my train than showed up around Dewey, our opponents began to get worried. The trip across Ohio from Cincinnati to Cleveland was made in the daytime on the Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton Railroad, which goes through a whole string of little towns, and the crowds there were immense. Former Governor Losch, who was a candidate for the governorship of Ohio, got on the train just south of Columbus, intending to get off again at Columbus. At that little town where he got on, there was a crowd of from six to 8,000 people, and at the next one, the crowd was even larger. At Columbus, the crowd was so big, they could not even fit into the station. This is the biggest crowd I ever saw in Ohio, the governor said. And then he rode on to Cleveland with us. He gave our ticket his fullest report. I worked my staff almost to death. I believe that at one time or another, I put them all to bed, and despite its long hours and hard work, I gained weight during the campaign. I worked the reporters very hard, too. The major public opinion polls, meanwhile, continued through the press and over the air up to the very day of the election to predict my defeat. I had heard stories, and I still don't know whenever you read these things, that like in the beginning... They actually had to go to send somebody when he'd stop on the train. He'd come out at the stop, and then they'd have to send someone out to go to the back of the crowd and say, give him hell, Harry. And and it was <laughs> artificial at first. I don't know. Uh, that doesn't surprise me that you've heard those stories. I, I, I don't know that that's true. I've never heard that. You know, anytime you're going to write a book, you want to tell a story, you have to have the attention building and building and building. And that's what's happening to this climactic moment. That's exactly what's happening in this story. So here you've got this guy who's, no, by the way, no money. The Democrats were, they, nobody believed they could win. So nobody do, donated any money to their campaign. So they go out on the campaign trail on this train with no money. For, for radio time, and they're scratching their way through. Just inconceivable. But a, as you get through closer and closer to the election day, the crowds that were turning out for Truman were crazy. They, he couldn't believe it. Nobody could believe it. And, and the descriptions of those crowds from the people on the train it, it, are fascinating. And you're right, he peaked at the right time. So by the time he gets to Madison Square Garden, it's, it's just mobs and mobs and mobs, unprecedented crowds. And, of course, he goes and he campaigns in Harlem, which is something that no president presidential campaign uh, uh, had ever done before. Yeah, I mean, I, the African-American vote, I think, uh, which, which had been Republican for a lot of years, I think uh, he's helped by that. Yes, well, the African-American community voted mostly as a block for the Republicans because they loved Abraham Lincoln, the president who had freed them. But they moved over to the Democratic Party starting in 32, but by uh, FDR's 36 election, uh, the African commu- the American community was pretty well um, linked to the Democrats at that time. Yeah, and uh, um, besides what we've spoken of, what else do you think that, that it's important for people to know about this 1948 election that they may not? Well, um, I can I can say this. When readers, if you read this book, it'll feel so much like today. And one of the reasons why is the degree to which political animosity boiled in the public discourse. These people were going after it. They wanted to win. And uh, they were attacking their opponents. But at the same time, there's an inspirational quality to the story, because even as this election is heightening and and it's so bitter, at the same time, Democrats and Republicans came together in a time of emergency and launched launched the Marshall Plan. Bipartisan support for foreign policy, very controversial program. They came together and they did it. So there's an inspirational element to the story to remind people that as bitter as our public discourse can be, our political discourse during a um, presidential election cycle, we're all Americans and the President of the United States is not our boss. He works for us. He is our public servant. And these candidates 
they realized that. They understood that in a way that sometimes I feel, feel might get lost today. Well, that's great. It is a book with many stories. We've just talked about a few of them, but you have to understand that there are scores more in the pages of Dewey Defeats Truman, The 1948 Election, and The Battle for America's Soul by H. A. Bame. He's been on the show before. We were really happy to have you on again. Thanks for thinking about us and coming on. So honored. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. A.J. Bame, B-A-I-M-E. His book is Dewey Defeats Truman, the 1948 election and the battle for America's soul. It will be published on June 2nd, 2020. Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little, but I'm sure there'll be pre-order, if not now, soon. Um, Go out and get it. You know, he's also the author of The Accidental President, which is uh, the book that we talked about last time. So maybe you can get a combo of those two and really learn a lot on, on Truman.